So there's a slug in this episode, and the slug is a metaphor for Hoshi and her situation on the ship, and it's a really obvious and heavy-handed metaphor, so if you don't like those, you probably aren't going to enjoy this episode. Although, if you had that much of a problem with heavy-handed metaphors, you probably wouldn't be watching Star Trek, would you? This is a review of the Star Trek Enterprise episode, Fight or Flight. If you have not seen this episode and you don't want to know what the potatoes on Enterprise are made of, be warned, spoilers beyond this point. It's the first regular episode of the show after the series pilot. What grand adventure awaits the crew of the first Starship Enterprise? Let's find out. We open on Hoshi and Sickbay staring at a slug. Okay, we're defying expectations. We're zagging when they expect us to zig. This is good. This might be something. The slug is a life form Hoshi picked up on a planet the ship has recently visited, and the slug, called Sluggo by a visiting trip Tucker, isn't doing very well. Dr. Phlox promises to do what he can to nurse Sluggo back to health, but he very notably does not promise not to feed the slug to his bat if things don't turn around soon. Meanwhile, Archer is in his quarters, and he's so bored he's crawling around on the floor trying to pinpoint a squeaking sound he thinks he heard. T'Pol comes in, and Archer's like, when are we gonna do something? T'Pol tells him that scans indicate no good prospects for inhabited planets on their present course, which doesn't bother her because she's a Vulcan and she doesn't care about exploring. She prefers to... I don't know, sit quietly and practice her multiplication tables while flying on starships. Hoshi drops in on Archer as well and asks if she can swap quarters with an ensign from the opposite side of the ship because the stars outside her window are going in the opposite direction of what she's used to. Archer's like, yeah, sure, fine, whatever. Now, if you'll excuse me, I've got a squeak to kill. In the armory, Malcolm and Travis are dealing with their own mundane but irritating issues. The ship's targeting scanners aren't properly aligned, which means if they need to fire their weapons, they might not be able to hit what they're aiming at. After running simulations but failing to fix the problem, Malcolm convinces Archer to drop the ship out of warp so they can do some real-life target practice. They fire torpedoes at some asteroids, but they're still not shooting straight, so Archer gets impatient and orders the ship back to warp. The only member of the crew who doesn't seem frustrated or bored out of his mind is Dr. Phlox, who is having a great time in the mess hall eating raw potatoes made of resequenced proteins and observing the other members of the crew, including two of them who he's pretty sure are about to head somewhere private and screw like space rabbits. If those crewmen are planning to do it, I hope they didn't fill up on potatoes. Starchy foods always make me logy. Hey, something interesting other than potentially lethargic and disappointing sexual intercourse between nondescript crew members is happening. T'Pol has detected another ship along their present course. It's small, and it's not going anywhere or doing anything, just kind of floating in space, but it's something. Archer insists they stop and take a look. They stop. They hail the ship. No response. T'Pol detects evidence of life forms on board, but she can't get any more specific than that. There is evidence, however, of the ship taking weapons fire recently. T'Pol strongly suggests that they mind their own business and get out of here, but Archer's like, are you kidding? A mystery ship? Possibly containing mystery people? There's no way we're not doing this. He orders Hoshi to join the away team, but she's extremely reluctant. She gets claustrophobic in spacesuits and would rather just monitor the mission from the bridge and handle any necessary translating from there. But Archer tells her she's just going to have to get over her claustrophobia and suit up because she's on the team. A team of Archer, Hoshi, and Malcolm takes a shuttle pod over to the alien ship. Once they get aboard, they notice that the corridors are spattered with green blood. If it is blood. Unless this is one of the old Nickelodeon ships. Did its crew suffer the consequences of doing something you can't do on television? With a bit more exploring of the spooky blood ship, they discover a fun room filled with corpses hanging from the ceiling. The corpses are all hooked up to tubes, which are carrying fluid that's being pumped into them or out of them or something, I don't know. The team returns to the ship and Archer wants to stick around and see if whoever attacked these aliens comes back. To Paul's like, or how about this? We leave. We have no idea what's going on here. We're in danger as long as we stay. This is none of our business. We should go. 
Archer reluctantly agrees, and Enterprise warps away on its previous course. In sickbay, Hoshi is checking on Sluggo's progress, it's not looking good, and confiding in Phlox that she's embarrassed by how scared she was on that away mission. Phlox tries to reassure her, saying that, you know, finding a room full of dead people would shake up most folks, but, Phlox says, if you really think you're not cut out for space travel, you could always go back to teaching at a university on Earth like a big crybaby wimp. Archer's having dinner with Tripp and T'Pol in the captain's mess, and he's not happy about leaving behind that ship full of dead people. He's all like, those people were in uniform. They were the crew of that ship, and someone murdered them. Murdered them on their own ship, and hung them up like meat, and we just left them there. We didn't even try to figure out who they were or what happened to them. What kind of people are we? And T'Pol goes, hey, I detected a stellar nursery not far from here. You want to maybe go look at that? Might be pretty. Might help to alleviate your anger or guilt or whatever other dipshit emotions you're feeling. T'Pol's attempt to distract Archer by dangling a stellar nursery in front of him like a set of jingling keys fails, however, and he orders Enterprise to be taken back to that grim, gack-splattered vessel. Archer leads another away team to the ship, this time including Phlox and Trip, and they, along with Hoshi, try to figure out what happened here and what, if anything, they can do to help. Hoshi and Trip work on the communications system. Hoshi eventually is able to translate the alien's language well enough so that they can transmit a distress call, while Phlox examines one of the alien bodies. Phlox deduces that whoever killed these aliens and hooked them up to this pumping rig was collecting a compound from their blood. For what purpose? Who knows. But Phlox does warn Archer that there are similar compounds in human blood. The team has to get back to Enterprise in a hurry because, uh-oh, the aliens that killed these aliens are back! And they're in one of those big, scary-looking bad guy ships that alien villains always have now. Remember when villains in sci-fi shows didn't always travel in ships that looked like they'd just flown out of the mouth of hell? Anyway, the scary villain ship attacks Enterprise, and by the time the away team's shuttle pod is safely back aboard, Enterprise's warp engine has been damaged, so they can't run. Malcolm fires some torpedoes, but the first one just bounces off the villain ship's shields, and the second one gets blown up by the villain ship's phasers. The scary villain ship scans Enterprise, and Flock says, uh-oh, that probably means means they know your bodies carry useful compounds, just like those dead aliens we found. They've got meat hooks with all your names on them, but I'm sure I'll be fine. The scary villain ship slaps a tractor beam on Enterprise, and things are not looking good for our heroes when another ship flies into the rescue. Maybe. It's another ship like the one full of dead people. It must be responding to the distress call Hoshi and Trip sent. All right. Except... When the captain of this new ship hails Enterprise, they're speaking a bunch of alien talk, and can't nobody understand what they're saying? Archer's like, Hoshi, you're up! But Hoshi says, I can't do this. I just learned their language like an hour ago. Anything I say will just be gibberish. I might only make things worse. Big scary space crab gonna hang us all on hooks and pump out our blood. Can't get much worse. So Hoshi steps forward and tries to talk to the alien. After a brief, awkward exchange in the alien's language, the alien hangs up and fires on the big scary villain ship. Malcolm announces that he has somehow finally fixed the targeting system, and he fires a torpedo at the scary ship, and then the aliens that came to the rescue deliver the killing blow, and the scary ship explodes. That'll teach you to do whatever you were doing, whoever you are. We get a quick captain's log from Archer explaining that their new alien friends are called the Axonar, live for 400 years, and use they-them pronouns. Fucking bullshit woke post-9-11 Star Trek. Then we get a quick scene of Hoshi and Phlox stopping by a planet so that Hoshi can release Sluggo. She says, This isn't exactly like the place where you came from, but it's not that hard to adapt. You'll be just fine here. And Sluggo's like, why did you take me from my home? The end. So, like I said, this is the first episode of Enterprise after the pilot, and those are always interesting. You've introduced the characters and the basic premise of the series and the pilot, and now you've got to actually do the show. And it's always interesting as a viewer to find out what that's going to look like. For some shows, it takes a few episodes. Some shows... Never figure it out, even ones that end up running for several years. Initially, it might seem like an odd choice, 
to make the first regular episode of Enterprise a Hoshi show, which this basically is. The episode isn't centered exclusively on Hoshi. There's a lot of non-Hoshi stuff going on too, but we open on Hoshi, we end on Hoshi, and Hoshi has the most significant character arc. So I'm going to go ahead and call this a Hoshi episode and then take a short break from saying Hoshi. But doing this kind of an episode right away makes sense. The essentials have been established in the pilot, including the main characters, so now it's time to start sketching out the supporting cast. Star Trek Voyager does the same thing with Balana in its first regular episode, Parallax, and Deep Space Nine does it with Kira in its first regular episode, Past Prologue, though it's not exactly the same since Kira is the second most important character on her series, not just a member of the supporting ensemble. It's ultimately the characters who are going to determine whether the series succeeds or it fails. If the audience doesn't care about the people on the show, there ain't going to be an audience. Fight or Flight does a fair job of showing us a bit more of who Hoshi is, building on what we learned about her in the pilot episode. She's young, inexperienced, living on a starship, zipping through the galaxy faster than the speed of light isn't something she necessarily enjoys, but also finding a way to tie her anxieties and insecurities into the larger story so it doesn't come across like the creators are attempting to develop her character by just adding neuroses. The Sluggo is Hoshi, Hoshi is Sluggo element is, like I mentioned at the beginning, really obvious and heavy-handed, but at least it's something. It shows that the writers of the show, primarily co-creators Rick Berman and Brandon Braga, who wrote this episode, are at least attempting to tell stories at levels below the surface. Starting the episode with Hoshi worried about how Sluggo is adapting to Enterprise and ending with Hoshi releasing Sluggo to a new home gives the episode a sense of continuity. Though the metaphor does get a little garbled and they need to give Hoshi that line at the end where she says to Sluggo, this isn't like where you come from, but you can adapt and thrive here all the same to make sure we understand that Sluggo leaving Enterprise is supposed to represent Hoshi deciding to stay on Enterprise. It's a bit inelegant, but the point comes across. Beyond Hoshi's story, the episode does a good job of cutting against expectations and depicting life aboard Enterprise as dull and uneventful. The pilot episode ends with the promise of going full Star Trek and exploring strange new worlds, but when we pick up things a week later, there's a whole lot of nothing happening. Only Phlox, who regards his shipmates with a zoological fascination, is enjoying himself. Everyone else is just impatient to do something, which is endearing. They're trailblazers. They want to visit new places and discover new things, and they haven't gotten to do that yet, and they're starting to get a little salty about it. Even Trip. The engineer, who theoretically should be paying most of his attention to the operations of the ship, complains to Archer that when he signed on for this exploratory mission, he was hoping he'd get to do more actual exploring. The episode does run the risk of not merely dramatizing boredom, but becoming boring itself, but I think it mostly avoids that hazard. The discovery of the ship full of corpses comes relatively early, and from there, things start to happen. We sit with the boredom long enough to establish it and start to feel it, and then we're off. The director of this episode is Alan Croker, a reliable hand who would go on to direct a dozen episodes of Enterprise, and also directed about a dozen episodes each of Deep Space Nine and Voyager. Croker does an excellent job with the scenes set aboard the dead alien ship. The lighting is dim, the empty corridors are atmospheric and spooky, and the image of all the dead aliens hanging upside down from the ceiling is genuinely macabre. The Enterprise crew members who visit the alien ship keep their spacesuits on the whole time, which I appreciate not just because I love when Star Trek does astronaut shit and nothing reads astronaut shit more immediately than people in spacesuits, but because it also serves to emphasize how out of their element the crew is while visiting this ship and how much danger they're in while they're here. When the big scary space crab bad guy ship arrives, the fact that this show takes place earlier in Star Trek's fictional history than the other shows actually comes into play in ways that are meaningful to the plot. 
The away team has to hustle back to Enterprise before the enemy ship gets too close, but they can't just beam back because the transporter isn't that reliable yet. They have to fly back on the shuttle. And they can't just fly the shuttle into a hangar bay with a big open door. It needs to be secured to a docking arm and be retracted inside, which makes, which takes time and leaves everyone vulnerable. Most importantly, when potential help arrives, they can't immediately tell that potential help what the situation is because they don't speak the alien's language, and the universal translator is not the invisible magical technology that it is shown to be in previous Trek shows that take place farther into the future. It's the sort of stuff that I was hoping to see more of in Enterprise where the less advanced state of the hero's technology and the fact that they haven't explored nearly as much of the galaxy as they have in the eras of Captain Kirk or Captain Picard affects what the heroes can do in the story. Captain Archer doesn't have the same options available to respond to a crisis that Kirk or Picard would have had. So what does he do instead? In what ways does this story have to be different? Because it takes place in this show. Too often, Enterprise takes shortcuts, papering over the differences in technology by just giving alternate names to things that serve more or less the same function in the story. But here, in this early episode, the creators actually take advantage of those differences. The lack of an instantaneous universal translator becomes a challenge, an obstacle that needs to be overcome in a critical moment when there's no time to lose. And overcoming that obstacle gives Hoshi an opportunity to face her fears, prove herself, and save the day. It all comes together quite nicely, for everyone except Phlox's bat. Having that slug in sick bay for days, just a few feet away, I bet that bat could practically taste it. But, denied. Ah, oh, well, I hope the bat likes resequenced protein potatoes. Fight or Flight is not a great episode by any means. I've never bothered to try and rank my favorite Enterprise episodes, but if I did, this one would probably land somewhere in the upper portion of the middle. It's solid. It's not outstanding. But what does stand out about it now, in comparison to how the rest of the series turned out, is the way in which it engages with its premise and its setting in ways that matter to the story and distinguish it from other Star Trek shows. One of the most disappointing things about Enterprise is that, after the marketing promised a bold reinterpretation of the franchise, it mostly turned out to be just another Star Trek show. Episodes like Fight or Flight suggest that that might not have been the case if only the show's creators had been as eager to explore new territory as its characters. Those are my thoughts on Fight or Flight. What do you think of this episode? Please share your thoughts with me in the comments. If you'd like to support this channel, and I sure wish you would, if you can afford it, you can do so by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash steveshives, becoming a channel member by clicking the join button, or by making a one-time gift by clicking the thanks button, or via PayPal or Venmo. Links are in the description. That's it for this grab bag batch. Join me next time as we begin a brand new batch of reviews, the final batch of the year. Can you believe it? The theme for the next batch is episodes that are set in alternate timelines. And we'll kick it off with an episode from the third season of Star Trek The Next Generation, a little show titled Yesterday's Enterprise. That's next week. See you then. Thanks for watching and take care, everybody.